I've got a few minutes uh, after these very stimulating and exciting uh, and inspirational uh, um, presentations and, and discussions to suggest that we think about accessibility as we're thinking about technology and teaching and learning. Um, when Peter Salovey became the president of Yale, he set forth a vision for the university. <clears throat> and he wants Yale to be an innovative Yale, and I think we're seeing uh, evidence of that today. Um, two other goals that he set are very dear and central to the mission of the CTL. Uh, to be the research university most committed to teaching and learning, and to offer a Yale education to an even more diverse student body. When he talks about uh, this, this, this second goal, he talks about an accessible Yale that opens its doors based on individuals and accomplishments, potential, and ability. What I'd like to ask is when we think about uh, this goal of diversity and our commitment to diversity, what is it that we think about? Typically, uh, we tend to think diversity means opening the doors to students uh, who, uh, of racial, ethnic, maybe socioeconomic um, uh, groups who have been underrepresented at a place like Yale in the past. There are other groups that we tend not to think about when we, t when we think about diversity. Another question, accessible. When Peter Salovey uses this word accessible, he's talking about financial accessibility. He wants to make sure that anybody who is qualified uh, can access Yale uh, regardless of their financial means. But what else might we mean by accessible? The population that I'm suggesting that we think about in terms of accessibility and diversity are, are students with disabilities. So you might not realize this, but Americans with disabilities is one of the largest minority populations in the US. There are 57 million Americans with disabilities, which is roughly equal to the number of Americans of Hispanic, Latino, or Spanish origin, uh, descent, heritage. Um, and that makes up 19% of the US population. In terms of, of the population in, uh, among undergraduate students, 11% of undergraduate students um, nationally, uh, as well as here at Yale, reported having at least one disability. But that number probably is, undercounts the total number of students who have a disability. Here's an interesting statistic. Of all the students who in their K through 12 uh, educational environment received some type of support from their schools, only one third of those actually register when they go to college with the office that is supposed to support uh, students with disabilities. So this suggests that of these 11% of undergraduates who raise their hand and self-identify as having a disability, the number is probably much larger. In some cases, the students don't even realize that they have a disability. The largest majority of these students have what we might call invisible disabilities. So when we tend to think about disabilities, we imagine a student who's blind and has a guide dog, or we imagine somebody in a wheelchair. But actually, the most common disabilities are largely invisible. Um, interesting story. I, I've, I've had the opportunity to speak with a number of Yale faculty over the years um, about students with disabilities. And oftentimes, I've heard them say, you know, I've been teaching at Yale for 20 years. <clears throat> I don't think I've ever had a student in my class with a disability. And I tell them, I'm sure that you have, you just weren't aware of it. Um, Yale students, for obvious reasons, are loath to raise their hands and self-identify and, and ask for extra help. Of the students who do report disabilities, 36% of them have learning disabilities, including dyslexia. 26% have um, ADD, uh, ADHD. 13% have mental illness or are dealing with certain psychological challenges. And all the other disabilities, which are the ones that we tend to think about the most, together make up 25%. So 
this graphic can, can actually, it, it actually explains a bit why we're not thinking about disabilities uh, among our students. Uh, because we're not necessarily, we, we can't recognize the students who have disabilities. So technology, it's been a real boon for students with disabilities. It's, it, it is allowing them more and more to be independent and to rely less on special accommodations that are provided by an office uh, devoted to that. So some examples um, for students with motor disabilities. And this, this can include somebody who broke her arm uh, as well as somebody who uses a wheelchair, somebody with, uh, with a spinal cord injury who might not be able to use their hands. Um, there are special keyboards that make it easier for them to keep up with writing assignments. Uh, there are also um, new and increasingly good speech-to-text technology. So rather than the student typing a paper, uh, there was actually a law student here who wrote and submitted his entire thesis using this technology where he trained a computer program to understand his voice so that he could dictate and correct, not using his hands at all. Um, it's pretty amazing. Uh, for students that have auditory disabilities, uh, captioning and transcripts are just critical um, as more and more faculty are using media uh, in their teaching and learning. We also have a service uh, for, for students who have hearing difficulties. There can be live captioning going on during a lecture. We have a service that's available. Um, you might not be aware of it uh, if you're teaching in the classroom and you see a student with a laptop open. What, what we can do is there will be somebody, it's basically like a court reporter, who is is, is doing a live transcription of your lecture, and that's being sent uh, through wireless to the student's laptop. So the student can watch and read and follow your lecture, even if they're not sitting close enough to, to lip read um, or uh, they, they can't hear for, for another reason. One last example. Um, I, I talked about speech to text. There's also text to speech technology. So a, um, a student who can't read uh, by looking at the text uh, increasingly use technology that can look at the text for the student and actually translate it into, into sound. Um, and one thing I, I'll point out here that, that it is actually very illuminating. This technology was first developed for students with visual disabilities, somebody who, needs, who can't see the text but can listen to it. What's really interesting is that um, the techno this technology that was developed for one population actually is very useful for another population. Um, and, and this is students with dyslexia who learn much better if they can hear something rather than only read it or can hear it at the same time that they're reading it. So this is an example of the idea of universal design. Um, the idea is uh, that if, you can, if, if we can find a way to create an access for one population, um, that, that access point might actually be beneficial to populations you didn't e even anticipate. This is the classic example. Um, if I asked for a show of hands of how many of you have ever pushed a baby stroller down the sidewalk or rolled your luggage cart down the sidewalk or taken a bicycle on the sidewalk, how many of you have actually looked for the ramp so that um, it made your life much easier? I see lots of hands. Um, of course, these ramps were not designed to make it easier for you to roll your luggage. Maybe at the airport that's the case, but typically these ramps were designed to help people who use wheelchairs. But this technology, um, this design that, that was meant uh, to meet the needs of one particular population actually makes life a lot easier for everybody. So this is the goal when we think about um, how can we make our courses most accessible? Can we find the educational equivalents of these curb cuts so that we are thinking proactively about the needs of a particular population in our course, but we're actually making our course more accessible to everybody? So one of the challenges with technology, even though it can offer a lot of support, it can also introduce obstacles. 
and this is why whenever we choose a technology, um, and whenever our students become very dependent on a technology, we need to be very thoughtful um, and uh, deliberate in the technologies that, that we use. We can unwittingly, by selecting a certain technology, make, our, make a learning ex experience inaccessible to some of our students. Um, good example, um, we have the Teal Classroom up on Hill House, and it's designed to promote active learning. We had an instructor a couple of years ago who was following all the best practices for how to lead an active classroom and discussion based in small groups. What she didn't anticipate was that a deaf student enrolled in the course. And this deaf student was very, um, very good at lip reading. But in a discussion based classroom, when everybody is talking at the same time, and when the professor is walking around the room and talking, the student had no idea who to look at, um, and she could not keep up. So she, she actually went to the professor and said, I really want to take this class, but the way that you've designed this active learning is making it inaccessible to me. And the professor was horrified. She was trying to do all the right things, and she had never really thought, oh, what if I have a deaf, uh, um, uh, a deaf student in my class? Um, so um, the challenge is trying to think proactively to imagine the diversity of students who might enroll in your class. Uh, and rather than be in the position that this professor was in, was after doing months of planning and rolling it out, all of a sudden having to rethink everything on the spot quickly. Can we be more proactive and more deliberate and thoughtful about the way we design our classes so that we're not discriminating against certain students uh, and we are providing as many, um, as many curb cuts as possible? So just a question. If anybody, uh, most people here are using the learning management system, any, any thoughts on what might be the most common accessibility issue we have in Canvas? Any, uh, any guesses? W one thing I'll mention. So we just, we just completed this transition to Canvas. It was painful. It, 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 it took a lot of effort from everybody. But one of the main reasons we did it was because our old system, Classes V2, was very, very bad at being accessible to people who use a screen reader. Canvas is excellent at that. OK, I'll give you the answer. Inaccessible PDF files. So faculty are increasingly sharing readings with their students uh, by scanning a, t uh, a textbook or an article and uploading a PDF file into Canvas. The problem is, if you don't create the PDF in the right way, a student who's dyslexic and using a screen reader or a student who has visual impairment will not be able to access that. So. There's a lot that, we do, that we're still learning. Um, there's a lot that we don't know that we're doing that is making it more difficult for students. So I'm, I'm very happy that uh, this month, in fact, on Wednesday, we are kicking off a new series through the CTL uh, where we're going to be thinking about issues, uh, uh, issues of accessibility in course design and in the use of technology. Um, and there is a handout on the table read out here that highlights a whole series of events going on uh, throughout the month of October. October is National Disability Awareness Month. Um, seven of those are actually offered by the CTL and they're highlighted here. So um, I invite you to, uh, to come to any that you can. Um, we hope to continue the series beyond October, uh, and we look forward to working with you. Thank you.